live stream. Got it. Okay, unless I've actually got anything to say, other than hello to people, I, I'm going to mute ours. Okay. And Thanks, Bob. We, we're we're going to be uh, video free this evening. Okay. <laughs> outgoing is concerned. Okay, well, I think we're live. Good evening, everyone. Um, coming to you live from Cannon Beach, uh, where we have had just an absolutely beautiful day, uh, which it was a break. We had some gray days, uh, but today, beautiful, absolutely gorgeous, wonderful sunset. So I'm a happy person this evening. Um, and also, it was exciting. I saw my very first common MERS fly up to Haystack Rock today. Uh, so that was really cool to see. And hopefully, you know, tough to puffin aren't too far behind, um, which of course are one of our very favorite species with the Friends of Haystack Rock. And, you know, yeah. welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Hannah. I am a board member with the Friends of Haystack Rock. And I'm so glad you all joined us today um, to listen to Josh's talk about killer whales, which I'll turn it over to him in just a moment. But before I do that, I want to mention a couple things. Um, so Facebook has this really cool tool that has captions that are live captions. Of course, they're not going to be absolutely perfect since it is um, computer done. And so if you need those to turn on, just make sure to click on the bottom. Um, where it says to turn on the captions. We will, of course, post this to our Facebook, uh, well, this will live on our Facebook page, but we'll also post it to our YouTube channel when I get my act together. So if you would like to turn it to, um, send it to anyone, you know, you can send them the Facebook link after this presentation, or you can go to our YouTube where it will be available as well. Um, if you do have any questions throughout the talk, please just make sure to put those in the chat and we will ask our presenter at the end of his talk, those uh, questions that you have. And we hope that you enjoy us, uh, enjoy our talk. It is going to be excellent. Um, I am really looking forward to it. I love talking about killer whales and I know so many of you love listening about killer whales. And so I'll ask Josh to join us in just a second, but I just wanted to mention that he is a marine mammal scientist and graduate student at the University of British Columbia's Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries Marine Mammal Research Unit. And he's gonna be sharing with us his talk, which is ecological aspects of transient killer whales off the California and Oregon coast. So uh, without further ado, Josh, take it away. All right, uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm very excited to be chatting with you today. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Um, let's get a presentation up, uh, here we go. Okay, uh, yeah, so thanks for having me today and um, I appreciate the introduction. I'm uh, going to be speaking a little bit today about um, a, a species, a population that I'm very passionate about. These are killer whales, um, transient killer whales in general. I spent um, close to 15 years studying them and um, up and down the Pacific coast. Uh, but today is something special. I'm going to be discussing a little bit more about the Oregon and California region, which are, are kind of not as well known for killer whales. Um, most of the research has been done in Washington State, in British Columbia. Um, not a lot of information is known about the outer coast of these areas. So this photograph here on the side was taken by um, a colleagues at the NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center. Um, and this was actually about 200 kilometers offshore of Newport Beach. So quite a ways out. And these are what we call transient killer whales, which I'll explain a little bit about what, uh, what transient really means. Um, but uh, what were killer whales doing 200 kilometers off the shore of Newport is kind of what is exciting about this study and what we want to learn more about. Uh, so this project I've been currently working on, um, I'm at the University of British Columbia. I'm a master's student and a research scientist there. And we are currently trying to conduct this thesis work to um, in collaboration with multiple different groups. Uh, this includes uh, NOAA fisheries, uh, the National Marine Sanctuaries, particularly Monterey Bay, um, San Jose State University, Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, um, Marine Life Studies in Monterey, as well as Oregon State University. We collaborate uh, quite often with a lot of the, the university um, researchers there as well. Uh, so this is a little bit about myself. As I mentioned, um, I'm from British Columbia, uh, Vancouver Island, born and raised, but I spend a lot of my time now in uh, Monterey doing field work just off the central coast of California. And every year I kind of make my way down the coast. We, my partner and I, we drive down the coast of Oregon into California talking to naturalists and fishermen, uh, 
in whale watchers um, trying to you know get information about the animals uh, sightings uh, and then um, spending our time on in the on the water. Uh, so first off, though, just a, a little bit of background information. Uh, so off the Oregon coast and California coast, we see a few different kinds of killer whales. Um, and this is actually in the North Pacific in general. We call these ecotypes, which are genetically distinct groups of, of killer whales. Um, so killer whales are one species, but we have these multiple different ecotypes that are kind of genetically diverging. They're kind of um, out on their own. They, they differ in their diet, their morphology. Uh, they differ in their social structure um, and behavior, as well as their acoustics. Uh, the first off, most of you know, are the resident killer whales, which are um, a, a salmon specialist. Um, they're fish eaters, uh, particularly Chinook salmon. Uh, so if you're on the outer coast, you, you might see a group um, likely could be uh, resident or because uh, we know that K-pod and L-pod, part of the southern resident endangered, uh, population uh, frequently come down the coast um, and are seen off the Columbia River. Um, you can see too their saddle patch. Uh, this is that gray area by the dorsal fin uh, can either be open or closed. And what that really means is an open saddle has these kind of black pigments that kind of enter in uh, the dorsal fin very rounded. Um, and then in transients, you can see this closed saddle. Uh, transient orcas do, don't have never been identified with an open saddle pattern. So it's just a solid gray area. Uh, and then also you can see this very sharply pointed dorsal fin, typically in adult females. Uh, we see this distinctive characteristic. Uh, and then the third kind of killer whale, which uh, is a very interesting ecotype is what we call the offshores. And these killer whales are predominantly seen in offshore waters, uh, seaward of the continental shelf. Um, they're also fish eaters, um, believed to be fish eaters, in particular more higher trophic level uh, uh, hunters. So basically look, they have been known to feed on sharks. Um, and they also have this very rounded dorsal fin. That saddle patch, though, can either be open or close. So very similar to resident killer whales. Um, also, what's really interesting is with each killer whale here, we can actually photo identify individuals. So if you're on the water and you take a photograph of a killer whale and you were to email it to us, we can actually take a look and see these different scars, patterns on the dorsal fin, uh, the shape of that saddle patch, uh, these notches, are all these congenital features that stay with these animals their entire lives. Um, so basically just similar to like a, a scar that we, we might have on our hand or, um, you know, if you, it's, it's a similar pattern we can use for, for identifying individuals. But with transient killer whales, um, it gets a little bit more complicated. We, we have a few different populations uh, in the Northeastern Pacific and kind of some of the focus of the work I'm conducting at UBC is kind of trying to figure out uh, the community structure um, of one of these populations. But uh, first um, we have what is called the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, population, which uh, is now been reassigned to be called the, the Gulf of Alaska Aleutian Islands Bering Sea Stock, uh, based on NOAA, NOAA's uh, recent 2020 um, technical report. Um, and you can see here that that stock runs uh, quite a far offshore, they've been sighted, uh, but into the Gulf of Alaska, uh, all the way down uh, into southeast Alaska, there's been a few sightings. Um, they're also along the Aleutians and into the Bering Sea. Um, another population is this little this little blue dot called uh, the AT1s and, uh, or the Chugash transients, um, and they're predominantly sighted in uh, the waters of Prince William Sound, the Kenai Fjords, uh, and there's currently only seven individuals left. Um, when first identified in March 1984, um, they were uh, 22 animals, but after the Exxon Valdez oil spill, that population declined. Uh, but these two populations actually do not interact, interact and they're actually genetically distinct. Uh, the third population we have here is uh, what we call the West Coast transients. And the West Coast transients are the ones that you're likely to see off the Oregon coast. Um, and we are now starting to believe there's a, uh, at least two populations or two assemblages, uh, we call our, our communities. Uh, within this West Coast transient community that basically spans from Southeast Alaska all the way down the, uh, the Southern California coast. Um, and one is a coastal community that stays uh, close to shore, they feed on uh, harbor seals, sea lions. Uh, and then we have what we call what we believe to be an outer coast community, which we were mostly the focus of this presentation that spends most of their time uh, near the continental shelf break and in deeper waters, but sometimes come into the coastal area as well. 
Uh, transients kind of got their name from being very transient um, initially by Canadian researchers, particularly Michael Big, who first identified uh, the different kinds of killer whale resident and transient. Uh, that resident orcas would spend their time on uh, the summer months following the Chinook salmon uh, that came into the inlets and straits. Uh, and they, they would be there on a daily basis where the transients were very much um, roamers. They would spend their time going from one area to another and um, you might not see a pod for years at a time. Uh, but we're now we're starting to see a bit of a change. Transient, they're not so transient anymore and uh, they're being more frequently sighted in areas uh, particularly off Vancouver Island and Washington. Uh, but my interest in California and Oregon started in 2009. Um, I was on a field survey off of southern Vancouver Island, and we were watching, myself and a research colleague were watching a group of uh, nine killer whales hunting a California sea lion. And we recognized the whales, they were part of this coastal group, uh, we call them the T99s. And I'll explain a little bit about that ID system shortly here. Uh, but um, we got a radio call from a fisherman that said uh, there was a group of about 40 killer whales actually coming towards us. Uh, so we were waiting, hopefully they were just gonna see residents because we don't see an interaction between residents and transients that often. And it ended up actually being more transients. Um, it was one of the largest groups that we had ever seen. Um, and in particular, this male here, um, uh, stood out. Uh, he was with one other female and we were photographing these animals to try to identify them similar to as I explained earlier with the saddle patch and the dorsal fin and, and these features here that are unique like this large chunk that's out of his fin and he got the nickname can opener. <clears throat> um, we really don't we didn't know who this male was at the time uh, so we spent about two months trying to figure out who he was and we finally learned that he was an animal that was uh, most frequently sighted off the California coast. Um, and from that on in, I wanted to know more about the population elsewhere outside of Washington and BC to really understand the overall range uh, and habitat use of transient killer whales. Um, and in particular, in the open ocean, um, the open ocean is a, a very interesting ecosystem um, that's probably the, uh, the less known of all the marine uh, ecosystems on our planet or marine biomes, in particular. Um, in areas where the open ocean can be what's what we call oligotrophic or nutrient poor um, in some areas where the ocean is basically a vast desert. Um, and killer whales do inhabit all the world's oceans. Uh, and, but what are they doing in these open ocean habitats um, is the big question. Uh, so currently we, we teamed up with NOAA and uh, during ship-based surveys to try to collect more information about these killer whales in, in these areas. Uh, so we did some review work, though, and one of the first studies uh, actually looked at this uh, coastal outer coast assemblage was conducted by Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada uh, in 2013, uh, using sighting information to look at critical habitat for transients off the British Columbia coast uh, in response to a recovery report um, uh, for Coswick and Sarah, which is the Species at, ri at Risk Act, because uh, transients are currently threatened in British Columbia. Uh, and what they found through um, an analysis of habitat use was that there was a coastal and an outer coast group, uh, preferably ind provincially individuals that spent time in deeper water, further from shore, that weren't frequently in uh, interacting with a coastal group, which you can see in the red here, uh, and the black is this outer coast group, which were uh, occasionally seen uh, in coastal waters. Um, I thought I'd share a little bit about uh, uh, little acoustics. Uh, killer whales rely on acoustics for communication, finding prey, as well as navigation. And transient killer whales in particular use acoustics for um, socializing, but when they're actually um, hunting or most of the time traveling, they, they remain fairly quiet. Um, and it's because they're marine mammal prey, like seals and sea lions can easily pick them up um, and hear them, and they lose the element of surprise. Uh, but transient killer whales, particularly in these coastal and outer coast group, do have different sounds. Uh, this is what we call a sonograph, which is basically a measurement of acoustics. This is a uh, one of these um, pulse calls, which is a, a particular call. Transients have about six to seven of these uh, in the coastal population. Uh, this was a, a recording we had when we were uh, documenting a group of transients off of Monterey, California, hunting a gray whale uh, calf. But I'll share a little vocal here for you, um, see if this, uh, you can hear this.
So that there is a group of coastal transients that might have happened after that recording might have may have happened during a predation event um, or after a predation event. Um, and that's when we usually start to hear these vocals and they're socializing after a successful kill. Um, but the outer coast transients, um, here's a recording was taken at the Clayquot Canyon. Um, that's off of West Coast Vancouver Island. And uh, you can kind of hear a bit different, it's a little bit more fainter, but you can hear the, they're a little higher pitched. Gosh, I'm not hearing anything of that acoustic uh, sample either. So the vocalizations can be a little different with the different groups that we, we've been finding preliminarily with recordings of the outer coast transients that the frequency is a little higher. And that may be due to um, trying to communicate over the open ocean roar, roar of the waves um, where uh, transient vocals are quite low frequency. So having to produce higher, um, higher frequency vocalization might be more beneficial for communication. Uh, but other than that, though, we went down the coast um, after that initial interaction with those uh, transient killer whales off Vancouver Island. We wanted to know more about them, and we decided to stop into different areas along the Oregon and California coast to, to either view from shore, talk to naturalists and, and um, people that were in the wildlife um, exp wildlife expeditions and whale watching. And we stopped in. This is probably a place that most people are familiar with, the Whale Watching Center, Depot Bay, Oregon. That's a spectacular place to view gray whales from shore during their northbound migration. And we were able to make a, a fairly um, good relationship with a lot of the naturalists in discussing uh, sending in sightings to our research uh, and collecting information, as well as there's a lot of posters for information on res resident killer whales as, uh, off the outer coast that NOAA Northwest Fisheries out of Seattle has um, along different areas to really try to get that citizen science um, data that might be beneficial for tracking killer whales. But as we, we ended up in Monterey, we we start we teamed up with a group called Marine Life Studies um, for the last five years, uh, which is a nonprofit, a great nonprofit that um, is focused on marine mammal conservation research and um, education. And we conducted field surveys with them. We would go out on a daily basis to collect data on a number of species from humpback whales, rizzos, dolphins, uh, killer whales, blue whales, uh, but particularly the five years that we were conducting field work was dedicated to killer whales. Uh, in particular, that it was very little information that was published on the killer whales in the California Oregon region. So, what did we find? I thought I'd share some initial information about the Oregon coast. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that killer whales are found off Oregon. Um, I've talked to many fishermen that say they just don't see them that frequently, um, but they are there. Uh, and sometimes it's more difficult because the Oregon coast can be kind of remote in certain areas um, or the weather can be quite rough um, and it's difficult to get viewings of them. But we've been finding that uh, the more we've reached out to locals, the more we're learning about killer whales in the area. So before we started this study, we kind of looked at a, an initial study by Green um, at all, uh, 1992, that did a, an aerial survey work up and down the coast to try to uh, look at the different populations of cetacean that inhabit the outer coast of Washington and Oregon. And it was really kind of a focus for gray whales, but at the same time, they were able to at least um, record uh, a number of different killer whale groups, uh, about 24 uh, different groups. And what was really interesting about this was that um, from talking with the author, most of the whales were not recognizable uh, or, or matched to killer whales in Washington and in British Columbia. So there were groups of transients or killer whales that were um, unknown or not part of that population that we frequently, frequently see in coastal waters. Uh, so we've built a sightings network the last few years. Uh, and uh, if you haven't seen it, I'll put it in the chat, but there is a group called uh, the uh, Oregon Coast Killer Whale Sightings Group. Um, we formed it a, a, a about a year ago, and it's now up to close to 1,500 members, and we've started to build uh, quite a database um, uh, that would just spiked our sightings. And you can see here, this is a map of the Oregon coast, basically from Astoria down to the California border. And uh, you can see the different um, color codes here. Uh, the, the red is the coastal transient, so that's that coastal west coast. Um, 
So er, for us to really distinguish a killer whale, we need to have a good photograph where we can ID the animal um, either to a transient or to individual. And, um, and then you can see kind of an unknown. Unknown is what we believe to be transient presumed, but unfortunately we couldn't identify to the animal to the identify the animal to the population and you can say, kind of see that in the gray um, and then you can see the yellow here is this outer coast group these outer coast transients which are seen predominantly more in the offshore waters um, and then the blue here is really interesting and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit but these are what we believe to like oceanic which are a group of killer whales that we don't really have too much information um, but we they have been identified predating marine mammals and found quite seaward of the continental shelf. Uh, and are different from the offshores killer whales that I mentioned earlier, because when they encountered, they similar they look similar to transients, and they were predating marine mammals. So, with the most of the group sizes we've been documenting off Oregon, um, the average has been about four or five. And in transient killer whales, the common group size could be anywhere between one to twelve. And transients live in these matrilineal systems when the matriline is basically a mother and her offspring, um, and these families typically stay with each other for their lives, but often there might be just some dispersal of individuals when they hit sexual maturity. Um, and that's usually around about 14 to 15 years of age. But on average, this group size is about four to five compared to the resident killer whales, which I mentioned earlier, it could be around 25 animals. Um, and this group size is typically um, in relation to their foraging strategies and diet. Uh, by staying in smaller family groups, they're able to um, use the element of surprise and be able to sneak up on their prey. Uh, and as well as using coordination uh, while hunting, that synergistic behavior of hunting. Uh, I split up the map here to show you kind of uh, the areas of Oregon um, a little bit so you can have a more of a spatial view, but a lot of the transient killer whales end up entering into these little areas, uh, these little fjords or, or um, inland waterways off the Oregon coast. And typically, uh, especially the coastal and the red are looking for harbor seals. Uh, they're specialists of harbor seals. Uh, and here's a photograph of a coastal trans we know as T49C, and you can kind of see he's got two big notches. He's been spending actually quite a bit of time off the Oregon coast the last few years, and we've had multiple reports of him uh, off Newport and off of um, Seal Rock and Depot Bay. Uh, he's been moving back and forth. He kind of spends most of his time on his own. Uh, he's a bit of a nomad. Uh, but what they're doing is they're actually searching for their favorite prey. The coastal population has been identified to pre predominantly feed on a these little rock sausages or orca or durs we call harbor seals. Uh, and harbor seals are the most abundant marine mammal species in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and each year they have this decline in the population where it kind of changes throughout the season. Uh, you can kind of see, uh, depending where you are geographically, uh, the harbor seal pupping season. So when they start to have the pups, which are the, the target of most transient killer whales are the, the easy to hunt pups. Uh, is dependent on the location. So off Vancouver Island in uh, Washington State, we see a, a pupping season that starts in about mid-July and ends in September. But as you head south, though, towards California, that pupping season gets gradually earlier. And off Oregon coast, it's in May and June. Uh, and it, it, in California, it can be even March, April. Um, and as you go further north, though, along the southeast Alaska coast, it can be May, June, and it gets uh, earlier again. So there's this decline in the population um, pupping season for harbor seals. So one of the things we found interesting was that there has been uh, it, studies done in British Columbia, particularly by Robin Baird and uh, Lawrence Dill in the 1990s that uh, were able to link seasonality of uh, transient killer whales. So their time, site fidelity or spending time in an area uh, to the harbor seal pupping season. Uh, and that was interesting. And that was, those were the months, like I said, July through September. Uh, but from our preliminary data, what we did find with transient killer whales uh, was a spike in May and June around that pupping season um, that's occurring in off the Oregon coast at around this time. So, and also we're noticing um, different groups of transients that aren't frequently sighted in BC and Washington that are sighted uh, off the Oregon coast. Uh, so one of the things we've kind of, um, teamed up with is with um, a couple of scientists, uh, researchers from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, who are particularly involved in the population stock assessments of harbor seals. Uh, and one of the things was kind of mapping out where the majority of uh, killer whale and harbor seal uh, haul out sites are. Um, and you can see here, these are the haul out sites just on in the B panel here. 
uh, and there's quite a few harbor seal hollows just along the coast. They like these exposed rocky areas, uh, these outer coast fringing reefs. Uh, and then you can see the killer whales as well. Uh, the predominant student, there's that map again. Uh, and we put a kind of a heat map over this to see, um, you know, where the more abundant uh, harbor seals were found. And you can kind of see the uh, harbor seals were quite abundant in areas just kind of south here towards um, the southern Oregon coast. Uh, and but also there was quite an overlap with killer whales all along here with transients, um, uh, presumed transients and transients um, all along this coastal area. Uh, you can kind of see here, this is a, a group of transients, coastal transients, we know is the a, a T50s. Um, and what's really neat is you can, they're real uh, specialists that hunt in coastal areas. So they can be found really close to the uh, haul out sites. This rocky area is a, a perfect spot for a harbor seal or a sea lion to be hauled out uh, to rest or molt or give birth. And the transients will often kind of sneak in and out of these areas uh, quite stealthily hunting the kelp beds uh, looking for harbor seal pups that may have been practicing their swims uh, as, as harbor seals are actually one of the uh, earliest of the seal species to actually take their young into the water um, in the first two to three weeks. And the killer whales will often spend their time in these little craggy areas looking for prey. Uh, they'll be quite close. So I apologize for the music there. It was a fisherman was uh, nice enough to send us this um, this video clip of a group of transients last year that were were hunting along quite close to the rocks uh, for for some harbor seal pups. Uh, so one of the things that came from this study was trying to really understand more about the population. Uh, the first kind of census or or work uh, photo ID work that, that was conducted on transient killer whales off the California coast was uh, in 1997. Uh, they discovered there was about 105 unique transient killer whales were found in that area. But since then, there hasn't been um, an updated catalog or um, study of, of any of the killer whales. So we expanded that to California and Oregon, and we produced a, a recent publication that uh, encompassed 13 years of data. Uh, uh, so what did we do? We formed um, alliances and, and colleagues uh, with colleagues at uh, NOAA's Southwest Fishery Science Center and Northwest Fishery Science Center. Um, and they were on ship-based surveys collecting data on killer whales, uh, particularly quite far offshore. Uh, we conducted our own focal follow behavioral studies. Um, and then also we co collaborated with whale watchers uh, in Monterey and, and throughout the Oregon coast to collect this data as well as citizen science photographs from people like yourselves that are might be tuning in or looking for whales during, uh, during the, the summer and spring. So our study encompassed quite a range. It was from Astoria all the way down to Point Conception, California, and extended out to 560 kilometers from shore, quite seaward of the continental shelf. Uh, and most of the most of our field work, though, was uh, uh, strictly in the Monterey, California region, uh, which I'll discuss a little bit later. Uh, but you can see most of the sightings came from there. During this time though, we, we, after doing a lot of the field work, we would also spend time at a lab. Um, we'd work at a, a, an area called the Moss Landing Marine Laboratories out of San Jose State University. They're, they're just in central California, close to Monterey Bay. And they have a beautiful setup. They, they were very nice enough to provide us um, time and access to their libraries and resources. And we would spend eight hours a day doing analysis and looking over hundreds of photos. We actually looked over 113,000 photographs um, encompassing that 13 years of, of data collection. And kind of what did we find? So what's really interesting is we found that there was a total of 150 individual killer whales we photo identified between 2006 and 2018. Uh, and uh, and they were we encountered them 146 times. There was 146 encounters. Um, and to get this process going, uh, the identification system, which was developed by Michael Big and his colleagues at Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, we decided to um, take each photograph of each whale and we'd give them an identifier, an alphanumeric identifier. So you can see this OCT letter system means outer coast transient. And then the number right here would be the 30th animal. So this would be the 30th animal. Her name's OCT30. Uh, her, her common name is named Emma. 
she's quite distinctive. She has this little uh, scarring here. Uh, and then we'd also, if she had an offspring or a, an offspring would be OCT30A and the second offspring would be uh, OCT30B. Now, if OCT30B, her daughter, was to have an offspring, uh, it would be B1. And this is kind of how we track the individuals and families. And through this, we found that 30 different family groups, um, mothers and offspring, uh, were in this population of study. Uh, and since then, uh, since this study was published in 2021, we're now up to 180 whales. Uh, so during the photo ID process, uh, it was really interesting. So we have the number of years photo identified on the x-axis at the bottom here, and then on the y-axis, we have the number of individuals. So on a given one, within one year, we'd have, a, we'd photo identify at least 60 to 65 individuals, um, but there were some individuals, um, around 10 individuals that would only been photo, 10, uh, 10, 10 years for one individual that was recited. So that was quite a gap in, in being able to photograph certain individuals in this. Uh, some animals disperse from the area or move on. Uh, throughout the study period though, we, we did find that we saw new individuals throughout the year. So on the x-axis here is the year um, that uh, whales were encountered. And then the cumulative number of photo identified whales is on the y-axis. And uh, continually throughout the study period, we got this, this um, almost linear um, uh, increase in the, in the number of animals that we discovered in our study. So the population structure is really interesting um, in killer whales. It's very unique and it's, it's the fact that you have a matrilineal system, this female and her offspring. So similar to elephants, but the only difference in, especially in the resident killer whale population, is that the males don't leave their mother. Uh, they often stay with their families for their lives. Uh, but in transients, we sometimes see dispersal um, of individuals. So for instance, this is Amla. She's the matriarch of the family, the OCT30 matril line. Uh, this is her presumed brother, um, OCT60. Now her offspring, so here's her offspring here. Uh, this is her oldest daughter. And her oldest daughter now has two young ones. Uh, so these would be Emma's grandchildren. Uh, and then Emma has another son and another offspring here as well. Um, so you can kind of follow these family match lines throughout their life, which is, it's quite spectacular. And we can get complete census work, look at mortality rates of individual populations, as well as birth rates. Um, and as I mentioned with the photo ID work, we can, we can also keep track of the individual whales as they grow. Uh, this was an animal named OCT44C or bumper. Uh, he's pre predominantly seen off the California coast with his family, but we first got photographs of him in 2006. And then through time, you can kind of see the development of the male dorsal fin um, uh, compared to females. If I go back a slide, you can kind of see the female dorsal fins very much uh, smaller, shorter, where the male has this very large fin. Female dorsal fins can be around three feet. Uh, males can be up to about six feet. And males go through this um, phase of puberty or um, sexual maturity around 14 or 15 years of age when they start to sprout that dorsal fin. But you can see he started to sprout it here uh, as time goes and now he's quite a senior bull um, here in 2019. Uh, from this study though, we're, we're, you know, the open ocean, we're learning so much more about killer whales in this uh, really remote habitat. Um, but what we found was that we have these outer coast transients, as I mentioned, that feed on marine mammals and live offshore. We also have these offshore killer whales, which are more fish eating specialists. Uh, but the one thing that stood out was this uh, group that we've identified 40 whales um, and we call the outer coasts uh, or oceanics. This, uh, this population of, um, that we're currently looking at, we're not sure where they really fit in, if they're transient or if they're their own population. We haven't been able to link them through association to transients, so none of them have been seen to mingle with known transient killer whales we've identified or any other population. Uh, we weren't able to match them to any ID database. Uh, this male right here was sighted 307 kilometers off the California coast, off Oregon, off of Monterey. Um, and they were feeding on a, a, a unidentified cetacean species. And you can see the black-footed albatross um, were flocking around and picking up scraps, uh, scavenging off the, the kill. That was group of four. Um, what's really unique about these whales uh, is that they have these interesting markings on their saddle patches and dorsal fins. And it's really only found in individuals that spend time in the open ocean. And we, these are uh, what, the leftover scars from a mesopelagic 
predator called our parasite called the cookie cutter shark. Now, cookie cutter sharks are only found in deep, warm, deep waters off the open in the open ocean, and that shows a little bit of where these killer whales might be spending their time uh, in open water. And the first real identification of these oceanic killer whales was in a publication by NOAA colleagues in 1997. They identified a group of about 34 killer whales attacking a group of sperm whales um, off the central California coast. And that was kind of one of the first things that was published on these oceanics. And those whales were not able to be matched to any known killer whales. So we're still learning new things about killer whales in the open ocean, uh, new groups of whales, uh, and it's an exciting time for us. Uh, at the end of this though, we were able to publish um, a recent catalog. Uh, it's free, it's a government catalog through NOAA Southwest Fisheries uh, Science Center. It's access to the public, you can find a download of it. I can, I can share that with you as well. Um, it has an ID catalog of all the killer whales that you might see here on the water um, photographing. Um, or if you're on a fishing trip and you might come across them, you take a photograph um, and you might be able to identify them. Um, so just to skip into the California region, um, California is very much a special place for killer whales. And a lot of these outer coast transients spend their time in uh, this area that we call the Monterey um, Bay National Marine Sanctuary. We also call it the Monterey and Pacific Transition Ecoregion. So it's a, it's a large area that's very, very productive. It has upwelling currents that a seasonal upwelling where nutrients are brought up from uh, deep waters to the surface where it uh, feeds a uh, uh, phytoplankton. Um, it also has this amazing canyon system called the Monterey Submarine Canyon that bisects the bay right through the middle and goes quite a ways offshore. And it brings a very oceanic pelagic ecosystem very close to shore because this canyon goes within five miles of Moss Landing. Um, and it can be quite deep, um, four to 5,000 meters. Uh, you can kind of see up here too, you got this large California current that uh, comes down the coast from basically Southern Vancouver Island all the way down to, uh, uh, down to California. And you have these different um, areas where a lot of people spend their time whale watching and looking for wildlife along the coast. Uh, so with sightings, um, are a little bit different. We see a bit of a transition. This continental shelf off of uh, California, as you go head down from Oregon to California, it starts to narrow. And the continental shelf narrows all the way into Monterey where that canyon is. So you, we're starting to see a bit of a difference in habitat use. We don't see the coastal transients as frequently. So uh, the red one here, where uh, those transients have spent a lot of their time in, uh, near the coast hunting seals. But we're starting to see more of these outer coast transients that, that prefer that from our sightings network and through our publication, we know from our catalog, we noticed a lot of these animals spent their time uh, in deeper water and near the continental shelf edge. And then also the occasional oceanic whale. Uh, and you can kind of see here, here's that Monterey Canyon in more greater detail. And you can kind of see it kind of branching into the open here and where the majority of the sightings are. So a lot of the transients in Monterey um, are, would notice a seasonal distribution um, and their foraging is a lot different. Now, these are two males that were uh, uh, traveling along the open ocean waves. And uh, typically they will use this canyon system here to hunt. And I'll explain a little bit about that in a second here. Uh, but first off, the seasonality. Uh, through all our sightings, we notice a, a seasonal difference in the killer whales, uh, similar to the Oregon coast, but for, for Monterey and off the central coast of California, we see a spike in sightings in around April, May, June, and then another spike in the fall, um, even though killer whale sightings are throughout the year. Um, here's an underwater um, video I thought I'd share. It shows uh, two transient killer whales in Monterey hunting. Uh, And that was taken from a colleague uh, at Marine Life Studies, Stephanie Marcos. Um, but diet for killer whales in, in off the California coast um, is a little different. Uh, from what we see, the majority of predation events um, we witness are on California sea lions or sea lions, uh, but also gray whale calves, um, and very much less on harbor seals, which are more frequently targeted for the coastal assemblage that we see off Washington and, and uh, British Columbia. 
So gray whale calves are the predominant prey um, with California sea lions. Um, the difference being that gray whale calves seem to be only targeted in the spring period. And that's where this, um, this seasonal peak here uh, kind of corresponds with that northbound migration uh, where gray whale calves are starting to come up the coast of their mothers in the spring uh, around April, May, they're, they're moving their way north. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned, gray whales right now, we're kind of getting into that season. Uh, we're going to start to see gray whales off the Oregon coast and California coast. Uh, they're, they're migrating north. Um, often it's the males and, and uh, non-reproductive females that are making their way up first. Uh, and then the females with calves kind of are the last uh, latecomers to head up the coast. And they will make their way up this uh, 18,000 kilometer journey uh, to the Arctic Ocean, unless it's part of a special population called the Pacific Feeding Group, which spend their entire summers off of Oregon, Washington, and, and BC. But this was a photograph taken from Big Sur, where this mother and calf are actually uh, hugging the shoreline within the kelp forest. They use the kelp forest for protection from predators like killer whales, uh, and they spend their time really close to, to the shore. Uh, but as they enter Monterey Bay, that deep water canyon, um, we've noticed um, a lot of the times that instead of following the coast around the canyon, they cut right across the middle. Um, and that's either because the females, as they're moving north, they're trying to expend as less energy as possible. Remember that calf is, um, is also a few months old uh, and it, it's trying to uh, save its energy as well. So they risk it by going right across the cut, the cut across as a shortcut. And as they do that, a lot of these transient groups will, will frequent Monterey uh, during April, May, and they'll intercept these gray whale calves. And it ends up being quite a, an amazing hunt, um, sometimes six hours in length um, that transients will spend their time hunting. First off, the, um, the behavior is really interesting. You'll see transients will actually keep pace with the mother and calf. And this might last an hour to two hours um, where they'll try to wear out the mother and calf. The calf might get too tired and can't keep up with its mother. And then as that happens, they'll try to separate the mom and calf. Um, and this is a photograph here. Once the calf is separated, the transients will often um, resort to uh, um, ramming the, the calf's head, trying to breach on top of the gray whale calf, uh, trying to submerge it, trying to drown it. Uh, here's another photograph here by Marine Life Studies. It shows a female here ramming the head of a gray whale calf. And one of the observations we found um, is that during these uh, predation events that the ramming of the head, we often see gray whale calves with a lot of blood coming from the mouth. Um, and that can either be the, the killer whales trying to either break the jaw of the gray whale, uh, so it makes it more difficult to breathe, uh, making it more difficult to lift its head. There's also a lot of arteries uh, in the lower jaw. Um, and also the fact that uh, in some areas of the world, killer whales have been known to actually predate and eat only the tongue and lips of, of lower whales. But in Monterey, we see kind of a mix. Uh, sometimes killer whales will eat the, the lower jaw and tongue, and often other times we see um, carcasses being fed on for days, um, sometimes two to three days. Uh, here's, for instance, uh, a gray whale calf that was killed the previous day, um, and as we return, uh, this killer whale was still feeding on this carcass, um, and they'll kind of share it, they'll split it apart, uh, and this could last for quite a while. So seasonally, though, diet does shift. As mentioned, gray whale calves are only predated upon in the springtime as they move up the north, up, up north from their northbound migration. Uh, but gray whales have a, a, an annual migration, a semi-annual migration, where they'll move up the coast um, during the spring, and then in the winter, they'll head back down the coast of the, their breeding lagoons in the tropics in Mexico. Uh, and we have never witnessed any predation events during the uh, southbound migration to in the winter. And this is likely because gray whale calves have gained enough energy. They've been able to get enough food when they're in the feeding grounds. And the fact that uh, it may be more difficult for the transients to actually hunt. Uh, but sea lion definitely makes up the majority of predation events. Uh, and lesser extent, some of these other prey, like some of these oceanic dolphins, like common dolphin, and um, as well as uh, other dolphin species like Pacific white sides um, and minke whales and dolls porpoise. Uh, the unknown here is occasionally we see um, carcasses or we see uh, tissue in the water after predation events already happened and we, we arrived on scene too late. Um, but we know there was a predation event because often there's either oil slick on the surface or there's birds like galls and, and albatross that are flying down and picking up pieces from the surface. 
but uh, we weren't able to identify the prey. Um, even though it's kind of sad to think about, but uh, these uh, uh, dramatic hunts on gray whale calves may actually provide an ecosystem service. Um, and ecologically, uh, gray whale calves provide thousands of kilograms of uh, living uh, tissue, biological tissue, to the bottom of these canyon systems, like Monterey Canyon, deep down, where there isn't a lot of food available. Uh, but there's all interesting, unique ecosystems down there that rely on these whale falls or for um, uh, prey that drift down to the bottom to be fed upon. So, for instance, you've got a Pacific sleeper shark here, which is a deep water species, um, a hagfish, different types of crabs and amphipods, um, isopods, um, and they will feed on these carcasses for months. Um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute actually kind of led some of the research on whale falls. And they would conduct these studies where they would look over the years at the decomposition process of large cetaceans like a gray whale that may drift to the bottom like this gray whale here. And what's one of the most interesting findings I found was that on these carcasses, there are species of marine worm that are only found on, car on whale bones and whale falls and found nowhere else. And one of the most recent studies has found that uh, some of these deep sea um, whale falls might actually link um, the same species of worms um, across, the, across the world's oceans. Uh, but sometimes we get the opportunity to actually view uh, some of these predation of, um, leftover predation events or carcasses of gray whales like this animal here that washed up in Monterey. And you get, killer whales often leave these quite nasty um, uh, rake marks. Um, and you can also sometimes see some of the issues through a necropsy, um, how the animal died, uh, what areas the killer whales targeted. Uh, similar to the coastal transients and the group sizes that I, I showed you um, a few slides ago, we see while hunting in California and Monterey, we see the same kind of thing. We see about five to six individuals on average, especially for a match line. Um, on, on occasion, though, uh, we do get these larger groups or multiple families that will form to hunt. Uh, in particular, the gray whale calves uh, will have 20 to 25 individuals. Other species, though, that are targeted um, also range from outside, outside the spring season can be Pacific white-sided dolphins, dolls porpoises, um, and sea lions. And here's a, a video clip we took of a sea lion our team took at Marine Life Studies showing a sea lion being hunted by a few transients. I won't get into the nitty gritty of it, but uh, the sea lion did not make it, um, but it was an interesting hunt to watch. Um, and with pinniped populations, one of the big concerns, uh, I'll leave this off with my, my last thoughts on this presentation is that in the last few years, there's been concern about pinnipeds, especially seals and sea lions um, targeting commercially important fish like salmon. Uh, but, and the fact that the resident killer whales uh, that rely on salmon um, are in competition. But with the seals and sea lions, the important thing to take from this is that the population increase in both have been actually supporting the increase in the transient population as they're the main predators. Um, if you're more, but that's, uh, I think, the end of my presentation here. Um, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, if you have more information, though, if you want to learn more about killer whales, uh, you can visit the University of British Columbia's Institute for the Ocean Fisheries Marine Mammal Research Unit on Facebook. Um, also, the Transient Killer Whale Research Project on Facebook, if you have any reports you want to share a sighting, um, as well as a few different organizations as well. Uh, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, Josh. A um, lot of great information. And we have uh, a handful of questions. So I'll start off with the first one. Um, Leah asked, have any orcas ever been tagged? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yes, there has been uh, tagging done. Um, depending on the kind of tag, there's been some with what's called satellite tags, others with D tags, which are suction cup tags. Um, with the satellite tags, uh, there was a, quite an initiative um, 
about 10 years ago on southern resident killer whales where they were they were taken to try to understand their movements off the Oregon coast um, and offshore waters, especially outside the summer period where it's difficult to get to whales in rough weather conditions, in particular the open ocean areas. Uh, so yeah, the southern residents were part of a large tagging initiative that provided tremendous data on um, on their movement patterns along the Oregon and Washington coast. Okay, awesome. And then Rachel asked, how how do we think the new wind farms will impact the whale migrations? Will the noise and or the base placements be too much for the whales, for their food sources? Will the continued noises impact their ability to communicate and navigate? You know, with, with wind farms, it's a great question. I think we're kind of at the early stages of understanding some of this new technology and how it affects um, marine mammals. Um, even though it's a great initiative for a solar energy and, um, you know, going towards sustainable, um, clean energy systems, um, it does have the potential to um, hurt marine mammals. Uh, anything that's in their habitat that makes noise or potentially can disrupt a migration route, um, there is always that potential. Um, I think in general, especially with um, we're starting to learn more about boat noise, for instance, on killer whales. We're learning that boat noise can have a significant impact on the foraging success of resident killer whales. And if you think, as I mentioned, transients rely on being cryptic. They rely on staying silent. And they often, and for transients, it might even be worse if they're not able to find their prey by listening uh, for splashing seals or sea lions. Uh, so I think there needs to be more research in that area, especially because this technology is so new. Okay, um, and then Carrie asked, do offshore killer whales follow the gray whale migration either north or south? So the offshore killer whales, um, as I mentioned, it gets kind of confusing. I was trying to explain it as best as I could. The offshore killer whales are actually this population that uh, feeds predominantly on what we believe fish and sharks. Um, the outer coast transients though, um, maybe that's what you're more referring to, the ones that I, we were, the, were the primary focus of this presentation, um, it, we believe may follow them north. And what's really interesting, if anybody in Oregon might have photographs of killer whales attacking gray whales, um, we know there's some out there that people have mentioned seeing killer whales attack gray whales, uh, but we've never been able to match any of the individuals that were involved in the gray whale predations off Oregon. And what we don't know is if the killer whales that are doing the attacks off Oregon are part of the outer coast group that we see predominantly off California that might be moving north, or are they part of the coastal group that feeds predominantly on seals and are close to shore. But the thing is, the ones that focus off uh, the coastal group don't typically target gray whales. Uh, they're harbor seal hunters. So in small pinnipeds in British Columbia and Washington, that's what we see them feeding on mostly. So it'd be really interesting to see if we can figure out which killer whales are actually attacking the gray whales off the outer coast. So if anybody has photographs, I'd love to hear from you um, and see if we can figure out who they are. Okay. Um, and then Eric asked, uh, shoot, sorry, something popped up. Um, is there any distinct genetic differences between oceanic and coastal killer whale populations? It's a great question. Um, so currently, um, we do know that the offshore form that eats sharks and fish, uh, we do know they're genetically distinct from residents and transient killer whales. So that's the third ecotype. But for in the transient, like the oceanic, um, we have no idea. Um, right now, we do know that the outer coast and coastal transients do intermingle. Um, so occasionally, we do see the outer coast transients and the coastal transients uh, associating uh, throughout the range, but it's not that common. But that's still that's an opportunity if they're associating. It's an opportunity for mating, which means we could have similar genetics. But the oceanics, we have, we have no idea anything more about the animals that we're seeing quite far offshore. Okay, then I think our last question um, is from Andre, who says, hey, Josh, wondering about when you're out at sea looking into these, how do you know where to find them? Radar, satellite imagery, or just head out and look? It's a good question. I It's, it's honestly head out and look. Um, you know, unless we've got the fancy satellite tags, which we often don't, um, it's searching by eye. Um, we often go out and look, we rely on people like yourselves that are out, um, you know, live in the area that can photograph or, or you see them and you want to send an email. Um, sometimes we go um, out in our own boat. We have our own boat Zodiac that we go out and look on our own, but it's, it's often just out and look on our own. Yeah. 
Oh, and then Katie chimed in and said that this afternoon in Manzanita, which is uh, just south of us in Cannon Beach, um, the orcas were were seen moving north. Uh, I'm sorry, south, and then grays were moving north. So that's really exciting. Oh. I'm gonna have to go out and look tomorrow. <laughs> well, that's great news, um, Katie. If you're, you know, if anybody's interested, I can I'll put the link here um, for you. But there's a uh, I'll give you our Facebook group. Um, that anyone can join. It's for anyone in the Oregon region that's interested in tracking whales. Um, and if you want to share that, that sighting, that is very helpful to us um, uh, for tracking information. I didn't even know about that sighting, so that's great. Well, Josh, thank you so much for uh, joining us and we'll make sure to put those links in the chat on the Facebook group so everyone gets a chance to see that. And uh, thank you and you all have a wonderful evening and check us out next month for our next library lecture. And you know, be sure to be watching the Friends of Haystack Rock Facebook page mm -hmm. as we have lots of events coming up um, now that it's starting to get sunny and the puffins are coming. Um, so we're excited to see you out at the beach sometime. So have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. you.